Open to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Over the course of the last six, seven weeks, we've been answering some questions of the faith. Some hard questions that we deal with. We've answered the question, why did God let it happen? Why does bad things happen to good people? We answered the question, why does God send people to hell? We answered the question, why didn't God answer my prayer when I prayed it? Why? Another question, why should I trust God? And then last week, we answered the question about what we do when sometimes we don't feel the presence of God. We also, the week before that, answered the question, why can't I stop? And so throughout the course of the last six weeks, we've been talking about these questions. Uh, and as you can tell by some of the questions, some of the answers are a little open-ended. Uh, let me first say, if you weren't here the week that we talked about why does God send people to hell, I don't really believe that God sends people to hell. It's choices that we make. But oftentimes the way we ask that question is why does God send people to hell? We think that it's him that does it. But this morning I want to close with a question that I can 100% fully answer through the scripture and give you a 100% positive answer to and that is, does God really love me? Now before you get super holy on me and tune me out because you know the answer to that question, well sure God loves me. I want you to be open. I believe that in some point in our lives we've probably all asked the question, does God really love me? And I know that, as I said a moment ago, the spiritual answer, the Sunday school answer, the Bible study answer is a resounding, yes, God loves me. But in those moments where we look in the rearview mirror and we are reminded of our past, in those moments when we're in valleys of life, in those moments when we don't get the answers from God that we want, we find ourselves asking the question, where are you, God? Do you really love me? If you loved me, why are you letting this happen? And so this morning, I want us to answer that question fully. But if you would, go with me as we pray this morning that God would open our eyes and open our ears to his word. God, thank you so much for today. And God, thank you for the opportunity to let us gather, Lord, and to musically sing praise to your name, God. And I pray that every offering that we offered this morning through our voices was a fragrant one to you, God. And God, that we brought glory and honor to your name. And now, God, as we dive open, we dive in and we open the word of God to some passages that we will know and have known and have memorized Throughout our time, God, I pray that you would speak afresh to us this morning. God, speak to us in a new way. Show us something different in your word. Let your Holy Spirit change us today. Lord, we give you all the honor and the glory and the praise. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So as I asked you a moment ago, open your Bibles to John chapter 3. We're going to read a verse of scripture that we memorized and learned in vacation Bible school and children's Sunday school. And we'll start with verse 16. And if you want to quote it with me, you can. We'll probably all say a little different stuff because we're different translations, but maybe read it off the screen behind me because it's going to be the one that I'm quoting from. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus, which is why we gather in this room week after week after week to praise his name, to worship him, the son of the Virgin Mary, Emmanuel, which means God with us, the reason that we gather week after week so loved the world, God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, Jesus, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life or eternal life. For God so loved the world, I grew up in a Christian home. Many of you did as well. 
And this is a concept that's not hard to fathom, that God loves the world. We talk about that often. We've turned away from God, but God still loves us. We trust God and we trust that He loves us all, but in those moments when we have those valleys of life, when we have those rear view mirror moments where we look back and we think about the things that we've done in our past and we start asking How can God love me? How can someone, how can God love someone like me? And if you've ever wondered that question, I pray that today through looking at this scripture and through some of the others, that we'll see that there is no doubt that God loves each and every one of us. I want to start this morning by giving us a couple of different explanations of love, definitions of love. The unfortunate part of the English language is we have one word that defines love. There's an agape love. uh, There is a phileo love. There are different kinds of love in other languages, but in the English language there's one type of love that we talk about. But I want us to see a a few different ways, a few different types of thinking when we come to the word love. And the first one of those is I believe that there's a love that loves because the object has value. There's a love that loves because the object has value or is valuable. And there's this love because the object that we're looking at is worthy of love. A love that because the object is valuable, we love it. And the most, it's probably the most common type of love. And this is the love that we know well. You love something because it's valuable. How many of us walk out each day and we talk about the things that we love? Oh, I love my shoes. I love my car. I love my house. Those things that have value. We could sell them and make money for them. We paid money for them. They, they have value to them. And we love those things not because of any other reason than because the object is valuable. But there's a second type of love that I want us to look at this morning. And this is where we'll camp out and we'll spend most of our time. And it's talking about a love that loves and gives value to the object. The first type is a love that loves because the object is valuable. The second kind is a love that loves and gives value to the object. The love that it has gives the value to the object. And I think that that's the kind of love that we see from Jesus. It's a love that not, it doesn't love because the object is valuable, but it gives value to the object in its love. And I want to explain it a couple of ways. How many of you growing up, And I know for some of you that was a long time ago. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. How many of you had a cuddle? A blanket or a stuffed animal or something like that? Raise your hand. It's okay. Things went everywhere with us. I think about my boys when we go on a trip. We've had to limit them to one, we call them stuffies at our house, one stuffy a piece. And Price has this dog that he likes to take every time, and it's fine. It's his thing that he likes. What does he call it? I can't remember. What? Bing, bingo? No, what did you say? Yeah, bingo? Okay, so he has this dog that he likes to take. Well, then Ford has this reindeer, okay? And this reindeer's as big as he is. And so we've had to change the rule a little bit that your stuffy has to fit inside your pillow, inside the pillowcase with your pillow. But the thing is, is these animals, they don't really have any value. But for those kids, for us when we were growing up, they were valuable. Maybe it was a blanket. Ford, when he was younger, he had a blanket. It was really Price's blanket. Price never paid it any attention, but Ford loved it. And then when Avery came along, she loved it, and I had to find the manufacturer and buy her a pink one because this one was blue. She needed a pink one. We have those things that, to anybody else, they wouldn't matter a hill of beans. 
But Price and Ford and Avery love them and the love that they have for them shows them value. And I don't know how long they'll tote them around. Ford's kind of left the blanket to the side. But when he finds it, he's like, my blankie. He calls it blank blank actually. And he loves it. And in those moments we see that those things that really don't matter to anybody else matter to us because we love them and the love that we have gives them value. We wouldn't want anybody else to take it. So for those of you that don't relate to the stuffy or the cuddle, maybe a car that's an old, broke down, in the garage, it's never going to run again, but it's your car. And it doesn't, nobody else would give you anything to amount to anything for it. But in your eyes, it's worth $70,000. Because the love that you have for it, Kevin bought one this week. The love that you have for it gives it value. Sorry, I heard you laughing and it made me think about it. Maybe it's some family heirloom that you have that's been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And you think to yourself, well, nobody else would want this, but I sure want it, and I don't want anybody else to have it. Why? Because you love it, and the love that you have for it gives it value. And what I want you to understand is this. This is exactly how God loves us. It's how He loves you, and it's how He loves me. Because we weren't anything but a rag doll, a stuffy, a blankie, a worn out car, some family piece of heirloom. We were flawed, we are broken, we are wounded, and there's nothing hidden from God, and He loves us anyway. Friends, He knows every single one of my flaws, and He knows every one of your flaws. He knows about the scars on the inside and He knows about the scars on the outside. He knows our innermost secrets. There's no value to us, but the love that Jesus has for us puts value on our lives. We're God's rag doll. We're God's worn out car. We're God's family heirloom that He loved us so much how do we know that God loved us so much listen to what Romans 5 8 says it'll be on the screen it says but God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners Christ died for us while I was broken while I was scarred while I was at the lowest of the low when I was broke down and didn't run, when the stuffing was coming out of me and my stuffed animal, God loved me anyway. So much so that He sent His only Son. Scripture tells us that God showed us, God demonstrated. He displays His own love for us in this, that while we were still rag dolls, while we were still worn out cars, while we were family heirlooms, while we were sinning, while we were disobeying and breaking the heart of God, He displayed His love for us. And while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And that's why I want you to hear it like you've never heard it before. I want to give you a fresh perspective because it's easy to read the verse, God so loved the world. But friends, I want you to think about this. God so loved Chris. God so loved Amy, Benny, Connie, Don, Sue, Linda, Wren. God so loved you that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. And I want you to not just hear it, but I want you to feel the love that God has for you. 
not just here in your mind, but feel it and believe it in your heart that our God loves us with an unconditional, immeasurable love. It's the kind of love that doesn't look for what's worthy in an object. It doesn't look for what it's worth. But it's a kind of love that gives worth to its object. In other words, our God doesn't love us because we're worthy, but God's love for us makes us worthy. I'm not worthy, but God made me worthy. When he went and sent his son Jesus to die for me, and therefore love isn't just an action It's not just what God does, but it's at his essence who he is. And scripture tells us that in 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 verse 8 through 10. Just a snippet of what we read a little while ago says this. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his only son to be the propitiation or the substitute for our sin. He is love. God is love. That's what he is. It's who he is. It's not just what he does but it's lived out in him. God is love. And I want you to see this. This is how God showed his love for us. He sent his one and only son. And this is why we gather to celebrate the birth of the virgin son who was named Jesus. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And hear this, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice, as the propitiation for our sins. This verse is ridiculously powerful when we think about the fact that there is nothing that I can do that is worthy of the love, but he loved me anyway. And it's way more powerful when you think about who wrote it. So let's play a little Bible trivia here. Who knows who wrote this verse? 1 John chapter 4, who wrote it? John. Okay? John wrote it. It's not a trick question. The book's named after him. But this is John, but I want to be clear, it's not John the Baptist. He was already in heaven. This was John who had a brother named James. And if you don't know, they were disciples, but they were not really what we would call disciple material. These guys didn't graduate at the top of their class. They weren't on their best behavior list. These guys were brash. They were not what you would think of. They they are the kind of guys when they walk in the church, you turn your head and be like, what are they doing here? Let's get the security team on them. Let's have somebody watch them. That's the kind of guys that these are, okay? They were rough. They were loud. They were fishermen. They cussed up a storm. They probably told fishermen tales. But they were disciples. They were fishermen with a reputation. And let me tell you what they weren't called. They, were, they, they had nicknames, but their nicknames were not Two Gentle Lamps. Their nickname was not the Bible Brothers. But instead, they were known as the sons of thunder. And when I hear the, the word, the sons of thunder, the first thing that comes to mind is a bunch of guys in leather riding Harley Davidsons. And if that's what you are outside of here, I don't see anybody dressed like that this morning, but if that's what you do outside of here, good for you. They were known as the the sons of thunder. And I'll tell you what, if I had a brother and I had a nickname for some Bible thing, I think I would want to be called a son of thunder. Because these guys flipped their character and they lived for Jesus. They were disciples. And they did what God called them to do. 
And again, like I said, I'm seeing the Harley and the leather, the best sort of way. And we don't know for sure what they did to earn the title that they had, but we, glim- we get a glimpse of why they were called the Sons of Thunder in Luke chapter 9. The context of Luke 9, Jesus was coming into town and the people, they weren't being kind to Jesus. They weren't welcoming him. They weren't bringing him and giving him all of the glory that he deserved. And the sons of thunder didn't say, well, let's go and welcome these people and bring them to our Sunday school and bring them to our church and our life group. Let's bake them some brownies. That's not what they said. In Luke chapter 9, verse 54, this is what happened. They said, and when his disciples, James and John, saw what was happening, remember they're disciples of Jesus. They're supposed to go out and invite people, right? They're supposed to share the gospel. When the sons of thunder saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? That's the sons of thunder. This was the guy for his whole life. He didn't just start fights but he finished them. He was the dad that got kicked out of the ball field because he was always stirring up trouble. This was the one that always caused trouble wherever he went. And then one day, John started spending time with Jesus. And every moment of every day, even though John didn't do anything to earn the love of Jesus, and even though there was no way that he could deserve the love of Jesus, Jesus simply loved John. And when we don't know what happened, it probably took some time, but little by little, John's identity, the way he saw himself started to change. How do we know? Because three times in the gospel, John referred to himself as the one that Jesus loved. Three times he called himself the one that Jesus loved. No longer the son of thunder, no longer John the hothead, no longer John the mess up, but the one that Jesus loved. And I believe with all my heart that God sent me to tell you this today. No matter what your parents said about you. No matter what anyone else made you feel about yourself. No matter where you fell short. No matter what you thought. No matter what you said. No matter what you've done. You are the one who Jesus loves. You are the one. Don't just hear it in your mind. Feel that in your heart. You are the one that Jesus loved. Jesus said if a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what does he do? The good shepherd leaves the 99. Why? Because he cares about the one. He cares about you and he loves you. He loves the missing one. I don't know who this is for, but I want you to hear and I want you to feel you are the one that Jesus loves. It doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter how dark you feel. It doesn't matter the regrets that you carry or the shame that you endure. You are still the one that Jesus loves. And it's hard to say that sometimes. It's hard to accept that sometimes. Especially when we're looking in the rearview mirror and reminding all, reminded of all of the past. Especially when we think about on the way to church this morning we got frustrated we said something we shouldn't have especially when we look back on life and we think of all the things that we would have done differently if we had another chance and even with all of those things you are the one that Jesus loves And he's loving you, not just because he has to, but he's actively loving you in this moment. And the amazing thing about God is this, that our God didn't shout his love from the heaven, but he showed his love on earth. He could have stayed right where he was in heaven and shouted how much he loved us. And that would have been enough. But he loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus Why? Because Jesus saves his people from their sin. He is the Savior who will save people from their sins. And what does does it mean to sin? Sin is not a popular word in our culture. But it simply means to miss the mark. It means to fall short of God's standard. 
And we've all done it. I've done it. I do it every day. I've done it too many times to count. And this is the very reason why we don't feel worthy sometimes. Because we continue to sin and we continue to look and we we think we feel unworthy of God's love. Because we know that we've sinned against God. And that's why I want to tell you about a God who loves you with a different kind of love. This is not a love that loves because the object is valuable. But it's a kind of love that gives value to the one that it loves. And so today, like I've said a couple of times, I want you to hear it. I want you to feel it. I want you to trust it. And I want you to believe it. You are the one. Whatever you did, let it go. The shame, the pain, the regret, he still loves you. And this week, I will pray that you will be convinced of Romans chapter 8, verses 8 and 9, when it says this. That neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present, I said 8 and 9, I meant 38 and 39. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the past, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And that is why we gather. His name is Jesus and he came to save the people from their sins. And so friends, I can answer with 100% certainty God loves you Would you pray with me this morning?